So yeah, my name is Mike. I'm uh, up at York at the moment doing my PhD. I'm looking at craft, uh, why people keep coming back to it, uh, what happens when we reinvent it and go back to it, and, and ultimately what, serve, what it serves society today. Um, what I want to present to you <coughs> is a series of kind of material evidence for cognition or the processes of cognition, which for me are <coughs> unfolding and ongoing processes and the results of trial and error. Uh, figuring out what works, how to get the knack of a tool, how to get the desired result of an action. And I use this verb to, to emerge out of these explorations because they're not really planned and organised, these, these processes. They just, they kind of happen. And when you get that kind of result of a trial and error, um, that's when cognition starts to become ingrained. I argue that cognition is maybe registered in my experiences. I don't shy away from how subjective this all is. In my experience, cognition is registered through gestures and those gestures are uh, they're kind of body technique that through sheer repetition of trying to get good at certain processes, they, these actions and this repetition, it acquires meaning because it contributes to that desired result that you're seeking. So I also want to understand how, as a, from a craft person's perspective, I don't see objects as a whole um, coming out of the archaeological record for me to interpret as is. I see them as compounds of action, compounds of lots of separate related, obviously, but separate sub-projects, and that constitutes an object at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> I don't want to draw any particular conclusion. My mission instead is to exemplify how cognition has kind of helped me or helped how I conduct myself in my shed uh, up in York, tucked away. It's actually the, the toilet from an outside, the old, the old outside toilet of a terraced house, reappropriated as is. Um, and in understanding these objects as separate projects, though, though certain tools lend themselves to those certain projects. Um, and those tools then inspire these kind of social categories within woodworking or within craft communities. Um, they mitigate relationships within a community of practitioners. A little nod for anyone who gets that reference. Um, so the social and the technical kind of emerge out of the same moment. They're almost like, on a, on a basic term, they're different sides of the same coin. Um, so the, the technical inspires the social in this moment. I'll discuss that more in a second when we come back to lathes. So to contextualise this, uh, these are some bowls. These are the ones that did sell. So maybe judge me by those ones, not the ones that are floating around. Um, in making these things, they're a co they're a, they are a combination of effects of obviously engaging with wood, with various tools, some hand tools, some mechanised tools, um, <coughs> but also the added economic pressure that comes with committing to commission. So it's a real kind of socio-economic <coughs> enterprise that I do, which I think differentiates it from, say, experimental archaeology and a more scientific way of, of studying objects. I'll focus mainly on the body and technology. It will, of course, cast light on craft culture, so like the social stuff comes out of the technical stuff at the same time. So, onto the lathes. These bowls are made on lathe. Um, points for if you can figure out which one or which ones were made on a pole lathe, which ones were made on a power lathe. I've experimented with both. This is a pole lathe on the left, my electric lathe or power lathe on the right. I've settled on the electric lathe purely for practical reasons because it actually fits inside my shed. Um, some technical stuff, some technical details. The pole lathe on the left here works on a reciprocal action. So as you press down on this treadle, it spins the piece towards you and you cut. On release, it spins away from you and you pull the tool back. Um, you can probably feel the profile of the bowl over there and see that process happening in the material. The electric lathe, however, um, works in one continuous direction, sometimes for many thousands of repetitions per minute. Uh, the benefit of this is that this contraction responds immediately to your body. When you stop at any point of, the, of pressing down the treadle, the piece will stop spinning. It gives you much more control over kind of more intricate cuts. The benefit of the electric lathe is that things can arguably be made more quickly, um, but because it's spinning so fast, things can go wrong very quickly as well. So but in my experience, the electric lathe inspires much more kind of respect and restraint. There's nothing worse than the misjudged angle of a cut, and it immediately kind of sucks the tool into the grain of the wood and splits like hours of work can be reduced to nothing in under a second. There are some floating around that demonstrate that. Uh, so that is maybe archaeological evidence for a lack of cognition, maybe, or <laughs> <laughs> archaeology of ignorance. Um, they have different toolkits associated with them. Uh, this is a skew chisel. This is what I would use on my stuff. The pole lathe usually works with hook, uh, these hook tools. Uh, there are direct archaeological ancestors for these, my favourite being found on the corner of Coppergate and Castlegate in York in 1906. So they're quite explicit evidence for this kind of historiosity of these tools. Obviously there's going to be overlap at, at points, but these kind of camps that people choose, this kind of technological allegiance through technological choices, 
they inspire these kind of separate kind of subgroups within woodworking. And it's quite, it's interesting, it's good for talking about, but it's kind of sad because you hear like snobbery between different groups. Like, I just want to be everyone's best mate, so I just I actually combine my techniques with different styles because I've learned from both. Um, <clears throat> so the bowls themselves will do a whistle stop tour through the creation of one. Uh, this is silver birch. Um, I don't think this one is actually around. I think this one made it to market. Uh, so I split the piece to size with a saw, face off <clears throat> the bit that I want to, I want to work, um, center, I get a circumference with a compass, I center that out with a filler drill, remove all the excess, make the profile of the bowl here. Um, there is a screw going in this, from the chuck uh, into the center hole, and then another bit on there. Can't tell. Sorry about how rubbish these photos are. Um, when you're making stuff, you don't want to record. But you kind of, it's hard to separate yourself and step back and be like, oh, I should maybe put this in the lecture slide. It's just you just making things. So these, that's why these photos are like this. The tail stuff here pushes into the screw, so that centers everything up. Um, as you're spinning, uh, I do the outside first. And unfortunately, you can't really see it on this photo, but this little bit here uh, is called a spigot. It's, as it's spinning, you kind of carve a dovetail joint into the base of the bowl, and that in, it kind of becomes a technology of its own creation in that sense, because it's a separate, one of those separate subprojects. There are spigots floating around. Uh, perhaps you can even see from the ones that are floating around this kind of process of getting better at that. Getting really good at that separate thing is important, because if you can use less material, it gives you more bowl to play with, more profiles to play with, and then still using that less, less material, but having a strong clasp, because as you flip it 180 degrees, yeah, so that's it held in the jaws of the chuck. So that's been turned 180 degrees now to do the inside. Uh, this is recentered for the tail stuck. So I'm going to check my time, sorry. So the <coughs> spigot here lends itself to a later process. So getting really good, breaking it up into these separate projects, getting really good at those separate projects when it becomes the stuff of bustle memory, that's the important stuff. So to focus on that, I will talk, you know, I've talked about the spigot, but also in, sense, in coring out the inside, <laughs> It's such an overlooked process. We see these objects as whole in the archaeological record, but to in, in, inform this, I'm going to kind of mime the gesture of coring out the inside. Again, this is a hybrid of pole lathe and power lathe techniques. Um, most power lathe turners or electric lathe turners don't do this coring technique. Um, you can even trace archaeologically along the profile of the cores of the pole lathe. So it's really hard to keep saying pole lathe and power lathe. Um, you can kind of see this, that reciprocal action as it goes down the profile over the course of a, an hour or so. The electric lathe ones, you can kind of see like one swoop and it cuts in at the end. Um, so yeah, use a little, little archaeological brains to trace that. Let's focus on this though. In coring out that inside, I kind of, you have to lean right over the piece. So imagine the lathe is here. You have to lean right over the piece and this is a bowl gouge to get purchase on the inside. That, that's the cutting edge there. That has to be parallel with the inside of the wall of the bowl like that. So you get right over the top, push it in, as you push down the inside of the bowl, you twist towards yourself and then towards yourself further, which pushes the tool away from you, ironically, and into the center. And like, if you can get that cut in one motion, it's the most satisfying feeling ever. <laughs> it takes ages to get good at that. But, so right over the top, when you push down, in along the inside, towards yourself and away like that. And it's, it's, it's brilliant when it happens, but sometimes like, the, the grain of the wood wants to pull itself in, pull the tool into the wood itself. And that, that's when those splits happen. Um, in any one moment, you're working in at least four dimensions, I mean, in, out, forwards, backwards, but then the tool can spin on the tool rest as well, so in a circular motion, there are multiple forces at play at any one time. And all of this kind of draws attention to the movement of the, the arms, the elbows, the shoulders, the wrists maybe. Um, I think much, the majority of archaeological and anthropological literature focus on, focuses on the hand. Um, we think of things as handmade, but in reality, it's a full body experience. Every time my upper body moves, it's complemented by some kind of symmetrical flow of forces of trying to control all those things that are going on through my knees, my, my feet, my ankles, um, and of course you're over centre as well. So there's this kind of, this mitigation of all of those things at play whilst trying to focus on the fact that also there are inconsistencies in the material just to make it even more difficult. So I mean, there might be a knot which will throw everything off. Um, and all of that is controlled by my lower back. Um, all of that flow is from like, it's, it's here, I mean, I had a, a sports massage recently for my birthday. It was meant to be relaxing, but actually it was brutal. <laughs> and it turns out like my lower back is, for want of a better word, like cream crackers, and it's going to get <laughs> probably will get progressively worse. So my, my bones, uh, the waste material, the 
traceable evidence of that swoop of the inside cut. That's all the archaeological evidence for this process of cognition, of getting good at this one part of the, of the creation of a bowl. Um, so, I mean, make of that what you will. It's, uh, <coughs> it's really hard to try and record these things whilst you're actually locked into that moment. You can also use the materiality of the log to your advantage. So these are turned against the grain. So if you imagine, where are we? Where's that tree? That's the flow of the cell structure as the, as the tree grows vertically. But then when you turn it kind of 90 degrees, uh, the, the sap and the liquids, they want to flow along that cell structure, along those grains. When you put liquids and sources into these bowls, gravity wants to pull them down, but that's cut off by the flow, that 90 degree flow of the cell structure. So there are ways that you can use the materiality, the way that the tree grew to affect design, if that makes sense. You know, so th these are all things that, these are all thought processes that are kind of archaeologically invisible, especially considering these are made of, made of wood. Um, so, I mean, in trying to explain these tools, uh, or some of these tools, in trying to explain how they relate to the body, how they come into their own within these separate sub-projects, um, I'm, I'm trying to guess a, a, an archaeology of gestures, I guess. And gestures are those like repeated body movements that acquire meaning for the meaning being that it can create something. Um, and with those gestures, uh, with the whole body being engaged in various ways, it's when those gestures become embodied, that's when cognition is registered. It's never a finished process. It's always, always trying to improve itself. But that's when it becomes registered, at least. Um, and it's from that embodiment, that registry of registration, of cognition, that's when you draw the ability or the, the confidence to take on craft work, craft work as a serious attempt to exist in this society. So it's through that marriage of the technical and the bodily, the social arises out of that, the social being inspired by what tool you use or what type of lathe you use. You know, so I mean, in that sense, for me, the technical and the social arise at the same time. Um, this is obviously, I mean, th those camps are delineated along kind of a techno-critical boundary. Um, and it's all the result of that kind of, yeah, that kinesthetic experience, that kinesthetic uh, engagement. Is that, I never know what word is more popular at any one time. It seems to change every couple of years. Um, so with that, I mean, we could roll this argument out into way more discussion on materiality, but we can't, there's no room for that now. I've, tried, I've had to rein it in and keep it about the body, the technology. So I'll draw a line under it. Uh, and welcome any questions that you have. And also, yeah, I don't know where those actually ended up. There's, it's kind of a diaspora of objects now, but yeah, enjoy them while they're there. <laughs> Thank you very much.